I'd like to say thank you um, for, for the invitation um, here, and I'm, I'm especially interested in that particular theme, obviously, of this panel about um, the, the relationship between law and surveillance studies, because I would echo many of Julie's comments about the real need for more of a dialogue between um, law and legal scholarship um, and surveillance studies, and, and I mean, a number of people are trying to make that dialogue happen. I think the Cohen book is actually a great example um, of that. Um, and uh, I also think that um, uh, David Lyon and this whole sort of surveillance studies project here has done a lot to sort of bring many of us, like myself, into the fold and have those sorts of conversations. So, you know, I certainly thank him um, for that as well. Um, my, my presentation draws upon my, my current research interests, which have been moving away from privacy law, although I still, I'm not abandoning privacy law, I still work on it, but centers on, on the rule of law. Um, and it actually sort of follows on um, some work I also presented here at a different um, uh, workshop, the one that, that was organized around surveillance after 9-11 um, a couple years ago, the volume that just came out edited by um, David and, and Kevin. And one of the arguments I made in, in my presentation there in the, the paper was that um, we really, in, in law, need to get away from solely focusing on privacy all the time and, and the privacy paradigm that it's, it's limiting and more explicitly theorize about rule of law ideas. Um, and that actually um, is, is somewhat ambiguous in the law that if we look at constitutional protections for privacy, um, in fact, we find rule of law themes and we should just sort of draw them out and, and make them more um, explicit. So for example, one of the ways in which um, that can be helpful is when you think of debates like you know, warrantless access to subscriber information, the privacy perspective says, oh, that's private information, the debate is all about it. is it private information, is it not private information, and we go off on that track. If you start looking at it from the rule of law perspective, you say, well, actually, a lot of the search and seizure jurisprudence was always about um, making sure that police get access to information within a framework of accountability and oversight. Why do you think the police should not be accountable for their access to this information? It transforms the conversation in a really important way and focuses on accountability, transparency, and oversight in really helpful ways. There are legal resources already there, and, and I think we need to, to work with that. Um, and at, at that, that prior event, also there was a discussion um, uh, for, for many people about how contemporary surveillance practices are actually quite at odds with traditional ideas of the rule of law. So if we're governing through surveillance, we're governing in a way that is actually um, in tension or frankly incompatible with many traditional um, understandings of the rule of law. Um, and that that is a really fruitful way to start to critique surveillance practices. And it's a powerful way if you're looking for sort of that pragmatic impact of how to get people to sit up and take notice and listen. Um, the rule of law is very, very powerful discourse. Highly contested one, but still very powerful discourse. So this current, my current paper is situated sort of within this dialogue, and I'm trying to reflect and do some interdisciplinary um, uh, work, hopefully somewhat successfully, but you can be the judge of that, to say what can law and surveillance studies sort of mutually learn from each other in trying to understand this relationship between surveillance and the rule of law. Um, so just a, a basic kind of point of background, what do lawyers mean when they talk about the rule of law? It's a vastly contested concept, but there is some agreement on a certain kind of core set of principles, very strong agreement. So these general principles that almost everyone um, agrees on are uh, principles of generality, publicity, non-retroactivity, clarity, non-contradiction, possibility of compliance, stability, congruence between official action and declared rule, usually along with kind of procedural and institutional um, implementation of that, like independent judiciary and courts. Okay. After that, all bets are off as to what people um, agree on. And you can encapsulate that list, that laundry list, they're sometimes called the principles of legality, with two kind of basic ideas, right? They're aimed at ensuring that law provides guidance to people, and their constraints on arbitrary exercises of power. Okay. Now, it's interesting, so yesterday when, when David was arguing that you know, we should find instances of, of surveillance that we think work and applaud, um, one of the things that he said was, well, you know, when, should, when should we applaud surveillance? He says, well, we should applaud surveillance as justified, proportional, transparent, and accountable. If you took that list and you talked to rule of law theorists, they would be like, well, that's what we talk about. 
right? Those are kind of the standard things that um, are, are, are vetted in the rule of law um, kind of discourse. Okay. Now, the first thing that I think surveillance studies really helps in kind of the legal thinking about what's this relationship um, and puts on the table that I think lawyers need to take seriously is that surveillance, um, forms of surveillance do have their own kind of logic or rationality. They are modes of social ordering. Now, everyone in this room probably says, well, yeah, why wouldn't you think that? Um, but if you look at the legal um, scholarship after in the sort of post 911 world on the rule of law, what it's focusing on is focus on sort of new powers or initiatives um, that increase official discretion. So the spotlight is on emergency powers or exceptional powers. Um, the debate is whether this is necessary in order to deal with what cannot be anticipated in advance so that you need some sort of uh, scope for um, official discretion to deal with what is unanticipated. Um, and what I think surveillance studies offer us is it shows that new forms of surveillance are not necessarily understood completely as part of sort of an exceptional decision making space needed to respond to unforeseeable circumstances, but it's a mode of ordering rationally aimed at predicting risks and preventing them, right? It has this other logic. Um, so that's the first thing that suggests that, you know, that whole sort of rule of law discourse that the lawyers are talking about in terms of national security um, is misunderstanding or not seeing something really important that's happening um, more generally. Um, and my paper takes up um, a, a, a very famous account of the rule of law by Joseph Raz, he's an Oxford scholar, um, and uh, he's a legal positivist. Legal positivism means a certain kind of technical thing, which I can tell you in the question and answer, but I don't think we need to get into it um, right now. But um, so he has this very, very influential account of the rule of law, and um, I, I argue that uh, it's actually not particularly helpful account of the rule of law. And there's sort of two very broadly speaking traditions of thinking about the rule of law. One is this positivist tradition where they very explicitly theorize that law is a human artifact. And it's also a very instrumental view of the law too, right? Law is a tool to achieve ends. And the rule of law is, is sort of uh, the thing that makes the tool good as a tool. It makes it effective. So the rule of law is all about making law effective. Law is a tool, um, and it's a human artifact. And then the other tradition is more that what I call the rule of law moralists. Law is a moral idea, and the rule of law is an important part of that morality. Okay. Now, in my paper, I actually focus on, on Raz's argument um, for a number of reasons. Um, and one of the reasons, um, some of the, the others I'll, I'll, I'll get to later in, in the presentation, but one of the reasons is I find it fascinating that you know you can have this account of uh, law as a human artifact that I think has an incredibly impoverished view of what artifacts are and how we interrogate them. Um, and I think this is another kind of critical point where the kind of work that surveillance studies does, not only surveillance studies, but the kind of work that surveillance studies does, can actually provide a really interesting framework for people who want to hold on to the idea that that law is a human artifact. It's a kind of human technology of sorts. Well, that's all fine and good, but gee, we have a lot of critical resources to bring to bear on how we think about that. Why is that not happening in, in the legal scholarship, right? Why do we have to, to find any of those ideas go into this full-blown kind of moral framework, which you may or may not want to embrace for reasons um, I'll get to. Okay, so what's Raz's view? Joseph Raz famously compared the rule of law to the sharp edge of a knife. Okay, so uh, being sharp, he argued, is an intrinsic feature of a good knife. And the fact that sharp knives can be put to harmful purposes does not make them bad knives. Okay. Similarly, the analogy goes, the rule of law is an inherent virtue of the law. That, like the sharp edge of a knife, allows us to achieve our end through law. But conformity to it can enable us to pursue bad purposes through law. Um, but the rule of law is morally neutral in relation to the end to which the law is put. Right? So you have a sharp knife, you can cut for good or bad purposes. Um, you know, we have to evaluate those purposes, but the moral evaluation is all around the ends to which the knife is put. Similarly for law, the rule of law makes the law a good instrument, it makes it effective, um, particularly for guidance, right? But whether or not the end pursued is something desirable is all about the morality of the ends. There's no question about the means, right? The question about the means is, is it effective, is it efficient? Um, 
He also said that the rule of law was in addition a negative virtue. He says it's negative because it um, prevents problems of abuse. But for him, he says, the abuse is what's caused by law itself. And now this doesn't fit with the knife analogy. Sharpness doesn't prevent problems created by knives. Um, so you already see that this abuse issue doesn't kind of fit very well in his um, knife analogy. Okay, but sticking with the knife, again, it's a very, very prominent view in legal scholarship. You apply this to new forms of surveillance practices, and you see, well, actually, it's surprisingly inert in helping us understand what's at stake when you say surveillance is inconsistent with the rule of law, because a position like Raz's would say, well, if surveillance is a tool, and if it's an efficient means to achieve a certain kind of end, then the fact that it's inconsistent with the rule of law is neither here nor there, right? Law is a tool to achieve certain kinds of ends. Surveillance is a tool to achieve kind of ends, other kinds of ends. So you just, the debate is about the ends, right? The question about the tool is whether it's efficient. Um, so the G that doesn't really help us. Um, if your concern is about abuse, right, that there might be abuse involved in surveillance practices, again, Rath has this curious idea that the rule of law, the way the rule of law cures abuses, are particular to the kinds of abuses created by law. So again, that surveillance practices might raise abuse problems, um, need to be solved in some other sort of way, right? Law isn't necessarily the way to deal with that. You've misunderstood um, the nature of legal ordering. Um, you know, there's a moral tradition of thinking about the rule of law, that it's a, a part of a moral ideal, and that law is part of a moral ideal. Why not just go there? And there, I think there's some caution in order. There are deep kind of political contexts in which these different um, uh, positions have played themselves out. So Raz has this position that, as I presented to you, is incredibly inert. Um, critically for getting at surveillance. But when he offered his position first in the 70s, he was actually going head to head with Hayek, and it was about the administrative state. It was about not hampering the state's achievement of many laudable social goods by a kind of very conservative invocation of the rule of law. And the rule of law moralists in the tradition that they come from very conservative, very strong around private property, private ordering, right? Um, Anti-government regulation. And there's a whole kind of edifice there. And that even the people who want to, in that tradition, who want to get rid of that edifice, nonetheless seem to buy into a logic, and, and, and Julie mentioned this briefly in um, her uh, remarks as well, that you have legal ordering or you have disorder, right? It's the rule of law or it's arbitrary exercises of power. Um, and there's nothing in between. And you think, well, that's a bit crazy, right? And so what people like Joseph Raz and, and people who followed him said, well, no, 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 there's multiple modes of social order. And some of them are quite good. And the fact that they're incompatible with the rule of law doesn't put an end to that um, uh, desirability of, of, of having those kinds of social forms. So the politics, when Raz was pro proposing this kind of a view, line up in a way that is not the case if you're going to now apply these various views to surveillance. And I think we should be cautious about just sort of jumping on the kind of rule of law moralist um, bandwagon. And another place where it comes into play, Joseph Raz is very uh, culturally sensitive in a lot of his work too, but you know, the rule of law is desirable in certain uh, cultural and political moments, um, but not necessarily in all societies, whereas the kind of rule of law moralists, like some of my colleagues, have a lot of trouble when um, you get to questions of, well, what about Aboriginal law? Is that law? Right? When we're trying to deal with the ongoing legal consequences of sort of the, 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 the um, lack of recognition of Aboriginal titles out in, in, in the West, is that, is that a legal tradition? If you're saying that the only justified law is law under the rule of law, well, that causes a lot of squirming, right? So I guess I, I'm, I'm very cautious about the rule of law moralist um, tradition. Okay, so that's why. I thought that the, the surveillance studies kind of inquiry into artifacts and this kind of means and logic that dominates a position like Raz is incredibly helpful because what it can show is that there's a lot at stake actually in the choice of your means. And I chose um, uh, Langdon the winner's work in this paper um, mostly because I was hoping that you know lawyers would eventually read this paper and that that was kind of user friendly um, to them for many of the reasons that, that Julie Cohen was mentioning about there's certain kinds of discourses that um, if you put down in, 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 in law, even though legal journals will publish anything, um, 
it, it's just going to turn a lot of people off. I say that as someone who, who wrote a PhD dissertation in philosophy on Levinas. Like I, um, I don't talk about any of that with my legal colleagues. Um, so I'm very, I'm very sensitive to that kind of temperamental um, uh, strategy. So, so I, I, I use sort of Langdon Winger's work on those sort of politics of artifacts to just make a really, what I think is a simple point, but one that's um, 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 not present in the legal scholarship which is to say that you, know, that you can't just say that the action is all about evaluating the ends if you have this instrumental view of law, that the means themselves right, have profound implications on social relations. Um, and, and the moral tradition in thinking about the rule of law actually has resources to think of the rule of law as a kind of human association. Right? It is a social relation. It is a way in which we relate to each other and to the state on certain kinds of terms. Um, and that's kind of the space, I think, in which you have to think about what's at stake if you have this different mode of social ordering that has a different set of assumptions. Now, I'm not offering kind of a solution to any of this, but to kind of lay out where I think that um, uh, debate has to go. Um, and then the other part of the paper kind of looks at law as a particular kind of instrument, and the, the kind of argument I make is that um, law, even in this instrumental view, is an instrument of public power, not private power. Right? And whatever else you say about it, law is not an instrument of private power. So to go to the knife analogy, the way I think I, I would revise it, um, is that, OK, you can take a knife, and you can jam it in a door and use it as a doorstop. But you're not using it as a knife. Right? You're using it in the wrong way. And similarly, law, you can have sort of you know, legal authority that legal positivists would properly identify as, oh yeah, that's a law, um, or that person is the proper legal authority for something. Um, but if they're using the law and the instrumentality of law for what look like right, private ends or some kind of private group end, then they're abusing law, right? They're using law in the wrong sort of way. Um, and so you still can get at this kind of you know, abuse of uh, power argument around the rule of law, even on an instrumental account, um, if you think about law being used um, in the wrong way. Okay. Um, so just to, to kind of conclude, I, I find that, uh, as I said, this, this focus on law as a human artifact can be a very powerful way of thinking about law and the rule of law because it doesn't valorize lawyers, it doesn't think that legal ordering is the only kind of mode of social ordering in the world. Um, it can be sensitive to uh, the over-legalization of areas of life, um, which I think we also have to be critical about given the, the sort of context of um, the access to justice crisis in Canada and, and, and North America more generally. Um, so there's a lot of critical questions that need to be asked about, about law and, and valorizing kind of legal order. Um, uh, at the same time, though, it needs a correction, right? It needs a much more sophisticated account of um, uh, what's at stake in calling law a human artifact and what might be at stake in the choice of means, right? Its impact on social relations, the way in which it both constructs and intersects with other um, uh, configurations. That's incredibly important. Um, and you know we've done this in law with the rise of the administrative state. So people thought that the administrative state was completely inconsistent with certain ideas of the rule of law. There was a debate. The debate is still ongoing, but the law has trucked on along and created a kind of hybrid area of administrative law that tries to um, figure out how to make administrative decision making consistent with certain aspects of the rule of law. And I think it's that kind of a hybrid that needs to happen with <coughs> surveillance. How do we get to the kind of surveillance we can apply, as David Mullane mentioned yesterday, is to try to figure out what would that analog be um, that we have come to terms with, to some extent, with the administrative state. How do we do that with the surveillance state? Um, and I think it can only be a joint enterprise, right? The, the lawyers don't have the resources to think about this alone. And I encourage the surveillance studies to really think seriously <coughs> about the rule of law resources that are there to take up um, as well. Thank you.